Um, my name's Emma Rigby. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Young People's Health and really pleased um, to um, be with you this morning for this session on young people health and poverty and joining the dots. So I think as long as I get the hands up, um, thumbs up, hands up, thumbs up from Paul that we'll just, I'll just kick off. Does that make sense, Paul? Absolutely. Cool. OK, so I'm going to um, just run through a little bit about what we're doing this morning um, and introduce um, the kind of the, the, how the session will run, so tell you a few practical things and then speak for about 10 minutes um, as um, and before we introduce the first um, main speaker. So, as I said, um, this um, is the session as part of the healthier theme on young people, health and poverty, joining the dots. Um, and um, I'm going to um, do a little bit of introduction and then we've got two fantastic speakers so we have Martina Kane from the Health Foundation followed by Jane South um, who's from Leeds Beckett's University and uh, Public Health England um, and so um, we will have about you know most of the session will be those presentations but in between each there'll be some chance for question and answer um, and also we'll have some chance to respond to questions um, at the end so if you have a question do pop that in the chat you can see the chat on the right hand side um, of your screen hopefully um, and um, you can just um, put any questions that you have and we'll be monitoring those as we go along um, but the first thing I wanted to say is that we also have some opportunity to do, think about a little bit of interactivity um, and we have a poll running this morning. So if you can see on your right hand side of your screen, um, there is a, a poll there. Um, and our question um, today is getting us thinking a little bit about those social determinants of um, young people's health, those wider things that impact um, on young people's health and all of our health. So let's think about our own health to begin with. So if we think about our own health, what do we what do you think has the biggest impact? Is it lifestyle behaviors, um, uh, how much you exercise, how much you smoke, how much you drink, etc? Is it the social circumstance where you live? Or is it how um, you access, how easy it is to access health services? So as we, um, as I'm talking and as others are talking, if you could um, have a little bit of a vote on those and we'll pause that. So, um, so just a reminder, so we're talking about why does poverty result in poor health? Um, and that's gonna be a little bit about what Martina says and then some of the things that we can do about that. But I'm gonna start off with my presentation now um, to get us thinking about the subject. So let me get on to my slides. Um, and here we go. OK, so young people, health and poverty, joining the dots. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the Association for Young People's Health. So um, I lead the association which works to improve the health and well-being of 10 to 24 year olds. And I guess why this is, seems really relevant for this subject is because actually we're all about joining the dots at the Association for Young People's Health. So we believe that, you know, young people's voices, what young people have to say are really, really important um, and they have to be at the centre of what we do, they're at the centre of all of our work. We want to be informed by evidence um, and research um, in everything that we do, but also think about good practice um, and innovation in practice and make sure all of those things then inform policy, both at a national and regional and local level. Um, and then last but not least, um, make sure that we're working in partnership and networks, because we really believe that if we're going to look at um, young people's improving young people's health, um, then we really need to think about working with everybody who has a role to play. So so we're really about taking that view that it is about a holistic approach um, and joining all of those dots in order to make things better. So as I said, I'm just going to kind of pick up the three um, words in the presentation. So we're going to start with young people um, and we often start, um, I often start presentations with that stat of 11.6 million young people in the UK between 10 and 24. And I just think it's really important for all of us working um, with young people um, to remind ourselves how many young people there are in our population, that they make up one in five of uh, the UK population and we really need to think about how we specifically respond to their needs. But we also need to listen to their voices and this is a quote um, from a young person that, um, from a young traveller who um, talked to us during the first lockdown about um, it being hard if you don't know how to read or write or how to get an email prescription. And that really just reminds um, me about the um, 
the importance of understanding the different experiences that young people have from their own, in their own words um, and in their own voices. Um, and I think um, we have been very conscious that in the lockdown and in the pandemic particularly, which is what I'm reflecting on at the moment, given our current context, that um, the experiences have been very different for young people. So sometimes, for example, young people have told us that lockdowns and being at home have been protective if they've had difficult experiences at school. Um, but for other young people, for example, LGBT young people have particularly told us about some of the um, non-protective um, factors of being at home, especially if they're not out about their sexuality um, with their parents or carers. So let's then talk about health um, as our second um, part of this subject. Um, so we know there's been a huge amount of attention on the impact of um, the pandemic and COVID on um, young people's mental health. And there was a huge um, understanding of, of, of the, the challenging issues before the pandemic. Um, we've got to remember within that kind of concern that many young people um, will bounce back and will feel you know, that they can recover from some of the, the um, short term impacts of, of the pandemic. But there is no doubt that there has clearly been um, a, a some really significant negative impacts. Um, and this graph here shows us um, something about the impact of lockdown loneliness um, and, and shows us that young people aged 16 to 24 were five, had five times the odds of um, feeling lonely in the last seven days than all other age groups apart from um, the, the, the kind of next um, most significant one was the 25 to 44 year olds. But I think it's quite significant um, and something which we have to really keep at the top of our minds. Um, let's then think about physical health and I think it's perhaps it's fair to say that there's been less attention to physical health um, during the last year or so. Um, but it is important to remind ourselves that we know that habits formed um, in this age bracket of the young people's age bracket can last a lifetime. And we really need to think about um, these things. So um, there is some emerging evidence of um, reductions in physical exercise um, that amongst young people that are greater than those reductions um, for younger people, for younger children. Um, there's also evidence around um, uh, increase in um, uh, difficulty sleeping um, with Cooth um, saying that there's 161% increase in sleep issues um, and some emerging evidence about changes in nutritional patterns but less clear. And so these are some things that young people told us when we talked to them in, in the first uh, lockdown. Um, and I think it just kind of um, stresses why these things remain important, that they need access to health services, need ranges of ways to engage, they need clear communication, but they also really appreciate um, social support and online social support via youth groups such as those in the um, Street Games Network um, and other clubs were incredibly helpful and powerful for young people. So last but not least, let's talk a little bit about um, poverty. And one of the things that we have been really concerned about during the pandemic and pre-pandemic are health inequalities and the exacerbation of health, those health inequalities that we believe we have seen um, during, the, um, uh, during the last year or so. And this graph um, has, was updated last week with data on the percentage of secondary school students who are eligible for and claiming free school meals. And you can quite clearly see um, that we are now at nearly 19%, 18.9% of um, secondary school students who are claiming free school meals. And the, the rise that did happen pre-pandemic, so it was beginning to rise in 2018, but significant going, um, continuing to rise and, and getting slightly steeper in the last um, year or so. Um, and so we need to, um, keep our eye to the issues around poverty um, and the impact that those will have on all aspects of young people's lives, including um, their health and well-being. And we're going to hear more about that today. So these, you'll get these slides and the links to all of the um, information that I shared there are from some briefings that we have um, produced during the pandemic um, and before the pandemic. So um, you can get all of that information there. And that, without uh, further ado, I'm going to stop my slide presentation um, and um, 
say that I'm really delighted um, to introduce Martina Kane um, from the Health Foundation, who leads the Youth Health Inquiry, um, and who's going to help us think about why um, poverty has an impact on young people's health. Over to you, Martina. Brilliant. Yeah, um, um, thank you so much. Um, the, uh, well, first of all, um, I'm not assuming that most of you have heard of the Health Foundation. We are a grant making charity. Um, we um, provide grants, particularly um, research um, and do quite a lot of work in the NHS and social care. Um, but we also spend a lot of time thinking about um, uh, broader issues around health and we have quite a wide definition around health which um, really thinks about the things that um, will help someone be healthy and stay healthy um, throughout the rest of their lives. Um, and the team that I work in work a lot on the wider determinants of health, um, as Emma just mentioned. Um, so we think about the things that surround a person that will are, will really support them um, to have a healthy life. And this is things like good work, surroundings, education and skills, families, friends and communities. And the reason we spend a lot of time thinking um, and talking about those particular things um, is we really see these as the sort of the causes of the causes in a way. Um, so if somebody um, is in good work, that gives them um, a great income, it can um, uh, create a, a sort of strong sense of, of identity, which can help their mental health. Um, and the inverse is true of, of the um, sort of negative consequences of um, poor work. Um, these things are complex, they're interconnecting, quite often they reinforce each other. So for instance, how money, how much money you have can affect your housing, it can affect um, uh, sort of where you work um, and it can sort of create its own spiral. What transport there is affects the work that you can do, what education you have influences um, sort, of, uh, sort of lots of the things around you and on and on. Um, I'm going to unpack this a bit more specifically around young people um, and poverty as I go through. Um, so first of all, I was going to, I'm going to lay out some of the associations between poverty and health. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple of graphs. Um, the first one is really looking at something that's been well known for a period of time. Um, so, then that slide disappeared. Um, the, the, that one, is um if we can get it back um really showing the um neighborhood level associations um so the average income in a particular neighborhood um and how that relates to the um years lived in good health um so there's a measure along the bottom of healthy life expectancy a, a measure along the side of healthy life expectancy um, and measure along the bottom of the average um, household income within the neighbourhood. And what you can see there is a really, a really clear curve. Um, so um, over at one side where you've got, um, you know, household incomes at around 15,000 um, a year, uh, you've got um, average life expectancy, the number of years that you would expect someone to be able to, to live free from disease, to, to be living healthily. Um, that's between 50 and 55. Um, and then over at the other end, where you've got, um, you know, average household incomes at, you know, 40 to 45,000 a year, um, you've got the healthy life expectancies up there between 70 and 75. So you can see, you can see a real discrepancy at that neighbourhood level um, of um, uh, years lived in good health, um, um, a sort of as dictated by the, the, the sort of average wealth of an area. Um, and the next slide that I've got is going to show that that's it's not just at a neighbourhood level. It's not just about areas of deprivation, although that does um, that does play into it. It also um, sort of shows up at an individual level. Um, so this graph is about self-reported health. It's about whether or not people say in surveys whether or not they feel healthy, whether or not they're, they're whether or not they rate their health as bad. Um, very bad, um, good, very good. Um, and the middle bracket is fair. 
Um, and what you can see in that, these are each of these bars is a chunk um, of 10% of, of the population. And what you can see there in the, the you know, the poorest 20% are, are, are both saying, you know, 30 odd, uh, more than 30%, more than a third of them are saying um, that, you know, they're not choosing good or very good as their health. And actually more than 10% of them is say, are saying that their health is bad. Um, and if you compare that to the, to the richest, um, ten percent, and the and the chunk below that, actually, you know, very very low percentages. It's sort of one or two percent are saying their their health are bad, and and you know, sort of less than fifteen percent are saying that their um, their health is only fair. So you can see again at that actual individual level, um, sort of self reported health um, being associated with um, uh, um, uh, income. And then the last one I wanted to show you in terms of graphs was was just this one that shows that, uh, you know, it's manifesting itself in the younger age groups. So the previous graphs were looking at the adult population in general. These are the, that same adult population broken down um, into age groups. And you can see that there's 16 to 24 year olds who are in poverty around about 20. Well, you know. Around about 20% of them are, are not saying that they're in good health, and you've got a good a good 5% of them saying that their their health is bad or very bad, um, and that bar is lower. That same 16 to 24 year old bar um, in not in poverty is lower, so it's coming down into um, you know sort of 17, 18%. The effect sizes are obviously um, sort of uh, change across the life course. So you can see a much, much starker um, uh, a difference between the two in the older age groups. Um, but that would be um, something that, that just uh, sh sort of shows how this builds up. Um, over the life course across both of those you can see poverty and not in poverty health you know health generally declines um throughout life but you can you can see it even there at um 16 to 24 and and even more so at 25 to 34 um how health and um uh, uh and money are being um sort of intertwined already um so i was asked um, here to really talk about some of the reasons that um, underlie that, some of the um, causes of the causes um, that, that we are so interested in in the Health Foundation. The thing that I'd really emphasise um, as part of all of this is again that these are interrelated. Um, these are these causes. The causes of this are wide, they are complex, and they are self-reinforcing. Um, but I'm going to try and unpack them a little bit for you. Um, at the Health Foundation, we've done quite a lot of work with the public thinking about um, how they understand um, health inequalities as well. And um, so I'm going to uh, sort of take take you through these um, in the way that sort of feels um, it felt when we did the work with the public um, sort of chimed and um, sort of the most simple and straightforward with them and then sort of building up to some of the more complex um, uh, 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 explanations. So first of all, the um, uh, the first explanation, which may feel sort of quite familiar with you, which resonated enormously with the public, is that healthy behaviours tend to cost money. Um, we talked to the public about this and they talked a lot about how healthy food is more expensive. They talked about the direct costs of participating in exercise, for instance, you know, costs of gym memberships, those type of things. Um, um, and this is certainly true. This is certainly something that um, is, is sort of is there, um, sort of making a difference to the health um, of, uh, of, you know, of everyone across the country. And um, I think we had emphasised that it's not just the direct costs of healthy behaviours. There are associated costs, the costs of um, transport to be able to um, to get to um, sports participation, for instance. Um, but I think we'd also really emphasise that there's something around opportunity um, and healthy behaviour. Um, so the food that's available to someone um, is, as well as its cost, is also going to um, make a difference about the choices that they're making. Um, but most importantly, with this um, particular area, I would emphasise that this is only a small part of a much bigger system. It's it's definitely a part of it, but it's a, it, um, it is one part of something bigger and more complex. Um, the next thing I'd really emphasise around um, sort of money and resources and health is how um, and sort of something that, you know, sort of the public and when we spoke to them um, really sort of got onto quite quickly was um, around paying for paying for the basics, really. Um, so uh, uh, the focus groups that we were with um, really understood uh, sort of the association between housing and health. 
they understood how generally healthier housing tends to be the sort of more expensive um, housing and how that can have an impact on health. Um, uh, we'd say that, you know, that principle absolutely, certainly, definitely true. And again, sort of moving sort of slightly beyond that. So it's not just housing and bills. It's also things that you wouldn't necessarily immediately think of as the basics like digital costs and the things that that then knocks on that your sort of your ability to do in order to protect your own health. Um, so as Emma was using the example earlier, if you're digitally excluded, um, the ability to be able to um, sort of protect your own health in all of the different ways is is, is more difficult. Um, but the other thing that um, money can really, really help with um, is around opportunity. Um, so the example I often use in this one, again, is around uh, around transport. So if you can afford to run a car, you have um, access to all manner of job opportunities that you don't have if you, you can't afford to run a car. Um, and this is where that gradient that we were seeing in the earlier slides really, really comes in. So um, in the earlier slides, there was a clear um, Sort of you know whilst there was a clear difference between the top and the bottom actually in between the two it chunked up in fairly regular intervals um and paying for the basics and being able to um you know access more opportunity when there is um, more money in the household is one of those things where incrementally it will increase more and more and i think that's something that we've really seen throughout the last year particularly around digital so the young people who had no digital access were not able to access education um, through sort of chunks of um, the lockdown. But actually those who had worse digital access, those who had worse broadband, those who were only able to um, access via a mobile phone contract, were, weren't receiving the same kind of um, education experience as the people who already had a laptop, who had fantastic broadband, who had a space um, that they could sit quietly for a um, um, it, you know, the, all of the day being able to work through their schoolwork. There was just that sort of real difference in opportunity and how it contributes to the wider determinants of health has been played out enormously over the last year. The last thing I'm going to say, particularly directly about um, money and resources um, and how they affect um, uh, sort of health at, at this particular level, up the safety net that um, money can really provide you. The expression is, you know, you're saving for a rainy day, but the knowledge that you can fix problems um, is incredibly empowering and gives um, confidence. Um, and for this age group, it's really important. Um, and you can really see a difference between the young people who are able to take positive risks. So the young people who are able to go and, you know, take up education opportunities, the young people who are able to move cities to be able to take up a new job. Um, those things are enrich health over the long term. Um, and those things are things that, you know, if you know that you've always got a bedroom in your parents' house that you can come back to, um, or if you know that you've got someone who's, you know, who'll bail you out, then that is a, a very different situation to you if you know that you are the one that you're going to have, who's going to have to make the rent every month. Young people make very different choices depending on the safety net that they've got um, behind them, even if their, their own level of income may on paper look pretty similar. Um, I was going to speak a little bit about the biology that sits behind some of this. Um, so the experiences that we've just described, particularly the experiences where there's not a lot of money around, um, create stress. Um, they call this sort of, um, uh, um, uh, well, and, and then and, and stress affects um, the body. Um, the uh, sort of way that the body responds to stress is um, sort of exactly the same as the way that the body, uh, you know, early humans responded to stress. So the biological response that sort of kicks in a kind of fight or flight mode um, is something that is is happening the same when there's a stressful financial situation as it would have been um, sort of, you know, back when um, early humans had to respond to the, the um, physical stressful situations that they um, had to face. Um, so you would you'd have you have the raised heart rate, you've got the mixture of chemicals, um, these impact across all of um, the biological sy systems. Um, and it particularly um, this this 
uh, affects children and young people um, as well, um, and, and you know potentially more so than than in older age groups. Um, so um, there have been studies that have shown that any amount of poverty in childhood um, is associated with worse health in adolescence um, and in later life. Um, the uh, research into this area really looks at this um, and the term that they used is it uses allostatic load that's really the name that they have for the measures um, of the uh, indicators of wear and tear on the body so those um, chemical fight or flight chemicals that I was talking about have an impact um, across cardiovascular metabolic infl inflammatory systems um, uh, and so the um, allostatic load measures sort of what the impact has been on these systems and can chart across the life course for an individual about whether or not they, um, you know, sort of how, what impact that this is having on their particular health. Um, and it's been shown time and time again about how, um, um, you know, time in poverty um, affects this allostatic load. It, it can, you know, it shows up in the biology, the, the stressful situations that people have been to. Um, and the same uh, sort of similar studies have also shown that around half the allostatic load that anyone will have in their lifetime is built up um, before the age of 14. Um, so I'm, I particularly emphasize that because, um, you know, the, the sort of childhood is in a really, really important time for this, but it is also not the end of the story. Um, so it can make a real difference um, if you are doing um, work with um, younger people to sort of, you know, change the course and get them um, into a place where they're going to be um, a sort of earning an, a, a greater income or having better um, economic circumstances when they're older, um, because it can have that, you know, it can have that effect um, and it can change the effect on their health as well as changing the effect on their, on their social circumstances. Um, some of the work in this area, so those same processes have been used to um, sort of narrow down particularly um, on some adverse childhood experiences. Um, um, I'm only going to sort of briefly touch on this research because it's only, you know, it's a very specific subset um, of experiences that are had um, by young people. Um, but the research in the area gathers together some experiences as these adverse childhood experiences. Um, and some of those are, are related to poverty and some studies count poverty itself in this. Um, and higher numbers of adverse childhood experiences are linked to poor health in the long term. So I really wanted to show you how sort of the literature there has really shown that um, people who have four or more adverse childhood experiences are, um, are more likely to, you know, they're four times more likely to develop diabetes, they're more likely to develop heart disease, they're more likely to develop respiratory disease. Um, the study that this infographic is from is one from Public Health Wales, um, and I particularly mention it because they found some really interesting findings about the protective factors. So the things that um, can be present in childhood, which can then buffer some of the um, bio later on biological consequences. So even if someone had been having at the adverse childhood experiences, what were the things that happened to them in their childhood that meant that the biological consequences weren't as strong? And one of the things that, that they found was actually regular sports participation made a difference. Um, it, they looked at some of the other things, so sort of think, um, factors around resilience, the um, you know trusted adult relationship. So I think alongside the exercise that's happening in the sports participation, there was um, they was sort of really emphasising how being part of a team, um, sort of having that trusted relationship. The other factors that sit around that are also likely to be protective um, um, and help um, guard against this particular one was looking at um, mental illness in later um, in later life. Um, but yeah, so where young people had had adverse experiences, if they had participated in sport, they were less likely to have um, poorer mental health um, in later life. So yeah, just to summarise where I've got to so far, there's association between health and financial resources. That's on a gradient. So, you know, the, there is a difference between the poorest and the um, richest, but in between the two, it makes a lot of, um, it sort of chunks up quite evenly. It goes beyond healthy eating and behaviours. Um, so it's about foundations, opportunities, the confidence of a safety net. Poverty is stressful um, and stress affects the body. And there are things that buffer this, um, in stress in child um, buffer this stress in childhood and that can protect health in the long term. Um, Emma I've got a, one more slide about the pandemic specifically is that all right yeah um, so 
I just sort of really, um, as Emma nodded to you earlier, we are in a, um, you know, the, this this year, this previous year, is um, sort of put us all in circumstances um, that, you know, many of us never would have thought about. Um, and I really wanted to emphasise on some highlights and work that the Health Foundation has been doing um, as part of our COVID impact inquiry, which shows how poverty is having, um, poverty means that COVID-19 has been having a worse impact on people. Um, so, and that's at the actual disease level. So people living in the poorest areas were at higher risk um, of, of developing and dying from COVID-19. Um, uh, younger people were being particularly affected by the impact of the lockdowns. So there's a um, point there about young people more being more likely to lose employment but there are also health consequences um, of the lockdowns on young people. So um, young people living at home with unemployed parents were more likely to feel down and depressed compared to young people living with parents who were still working. Um, if you're interested in the impact of the pandemic and how it's affected different groups, how it's affected people in poverty, how it's affected young people, how it's affected people from different ethnicities, um, the report from the Health Foundation is launching on the 6th of July. So I'd really, um, you know, look out for that because it's been a sort of big piece of work pulling together lots and lots of the available evidence. Um, and then I know that Jane's going to talk about what we can do. But just from my perspective, you know, this is a large and complex problem. Um, but solutions to it aren't necessarily complex. There are just lots of them um, at lots of different levels in lots of different areas across all sorts of different sectors. Um, so there will be a way to um, make a difference and change a wider determinant of health for a child or a young person's life that will affect their health in the long term. Um, so, you know, this, um, whilst the Health Foundation does call for a um, cross-government strategy that will, that will make a difference across different sectors on this, there's a lot of action that is already going on and, and could potentially go on in your area to, to really make a difference on this one. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's me done. There's a, a, some links on there um, that might be useful to you. Um, my email address, the Future Health Inquiry, which is young people specific work that, that I work on, um, and the Evidence Hub, which is where some of the, the slides have come from. Um, but Emma, I think, were we going to have some um, questions now, questions after Jane's presentation? Yeah, I can see if we've got any questions. Um, People, if you haven't put your question yet in the chat, do do that. I want to start with just saying thank you. And I, I was going to say thank you, but I'm going to use the words from the chat. So somebody from Y Sports have said, has said, wonderful presentation, Mike, Martina. Eye-opening stats and information, um, which is a really um, fantastic summary. It was fantastic. Um, and um, we are going to make those slides available. Um, I don't, Paul, have we got any other questions that have come up? Uh, yeah, I've got one from the chat it's from um, Keely in Cornwall. Quite, it's one for you, Martina, um, which is quite a nice little one, actually, I think. Um, what piece of research would you like to do? Um, in other words, and what she's qualified that by saying, what's the most important thing we don't know about young people's health? Oh, so I, I will often say like it's partly the complexity that is some of the things. So it's just so difficult to unpick what is causing what um, and where and how. So I, I, you know, for when it comes to my job, that 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 then becomes its own problem, and I want to look in in sort of certain particular ways. Um, my, I'm I've got a mental health background, so I'm particularly interested in um, making sure um, that people sort of young people start off in a great way so I really am interested in the things that help young people understand um you know understand themselves um you know set up in ways that means that they are um you know are going to be able to you know really sort of mentally thrive throughout the rest of their life so I'm I'm really interested in the things that support young people to be um you know sort of you know get off on a positive foot when it comes to mental health and uh, those locally trusted, uh, what's the best way those locally trusted organisations can help to contribute to that evidence base? Oh, interesting question around the evidence base. I mean, the, one of the reasons I love um, the Street Games Network is um, quite a lot of the people like, you know, when I'm working in health, people will be like, yes, exercise. That's, you know, it, it's a healthy mm -hmm. behaviour. It's the thing. Whereas I think you guys have a good understanding of what sport can be beyond that and about how it really is, um, especially for this age group, there's a lot that you can look at around um, 
making a difference and how a young person might be on a particular track and then actually if you like you know if you can make small interventions there's a whole range of literature which you can go and look at on on some of the work around how um you know the the um brain development of this age group is just so um so huge so um enormous um and which which really indicates that the things that you do during this age group really really matter um and we've done quite a lot of work thinking about you know you've got education and you've got families but actually the other things um that young people do they themselves say is incredibly important so you know we we think a bit about youth services but sort of everything that they're doing including sports participation um sort of really really makes a massive difference fantastic there's a couple Thanks. more but i think we better wait until um... yeah i was going to say let's let's um uh, do keep on coming with those questions i can see some really great ones coming up um we might respond to some of those in the chat paul's given his email address for afterwards but we will come to them at the end of the session as well and, and thanks so much Martha march that's fantastic i just want to remind people that the poll is still running um it's you know looking at lifestyle behaviors is in the lead at the moment but do um do have a little go at um answering the poll and we'll come back to that um straight away after um jane's presentation um but i'm going to pass over on to jane south now without any further ado he's going to help us us to think about some of the things that we can do and Jane is from Leeds Beckett University and also works with Public Health England. Over to you Jane. Hi thank you Emma and thank you everybody for inviting me here. I hope I'm going to start my presentation. Yeah that seems to be up. Um, I'm going to focus very much on, on the how and what we do at a community level because I think work um, with communities as equal partners really is part of the way we join the dots on um, poverty and health, because it can feel, as I think uh, Martina alluded to, quite overwhelming, these sort of huge factors that are at work. But I'm hoping well, through my presentation to show that this community work, which I know is at the heart of street games, is really important approach to reducing the health gap and reducing health inequalities. So just a little bit about myself. I'm a, a researcher. I've been researching in the area of the, the kind of things that communities do to support good health for a number of years now. But I also work with Public Health England as a national advisor. And I'm going to draw on some of that Public Health England work. But the view this is very much a personal perspective in this presentation. And what I particularly want to do is to look very briefly at why communities matter to health. I then want to look at some of the practical approaches uh, that are drawing on evidence and particularly the family of community centred approaches for health and well-being. And then as I come to the end, there's sort of lots of re resources which I've sort of put into a slide that you can um, perhaps access because it's often important for community organisations to make a case um, before I go on to some of the sort of concluding remarks. So starting with why communities sort of matter for health, and I'm hoping that everybody working in street games will be well aware of these um, arguments. But I think it's important, communities have a place in the broader public health field, very much so, and work with communities does. Partly because we know that, and Martina's presentation showed this, that where you live and the quality of the relationships of the people around you and the people you connect to is really one of the fundamental factors that are driving health. And so therefore creating connected, resilient, more cohesive communities or groups is one way of promoting good health. And it also the uh, issue of, of power or empowerment um, is very important because we know that in disempowerment is linked to poverty and all those inequalities but actually um, in enabling people to have a greater say in their health and lives um, whether that's an area level or an individual level is a positive um, factor in health and so that the sort of issue of control and power threads through all the other um, factors that uh, Martina sort of looked at through the sort of wider determinants of health. But also um, community-centred approaches that place communities at the heart of public health are very important if we're going to take on a strategic approach to health inequalities. And I think at its simplest, you can think about it, is how on earth can we design societal solutions 
to health inequalities without involving the people who bear the biggest burden of those inequalities. And I think it's at a baseline, it's as simple as that. But also we know, and I'm going to share some of those approaches, we know that participatory approaches are used the world over, not just in the UK, because engaging people and listening to their experiences, their needs and ambitions directly address sort of marginalisation, powerlessness and engaging people at most at risk of poor health. And that's why they're so important as part of a um, community level action around health inequalities. And I want to um, reflect a little bit on the pandemic uh, with this because those things have been true for decades, you know, and accepted by the WHO. But um, when we're thinking uh, in a pandemic, anyone who didn't think communities mattered for health before the pandemic, certainly I think understands that they do now because we've seen this massive volunteer and community response to the changes and challenges in the pandemic. People couldn't have kept in the shield at the beginning without that community response. And that involved all sort of generations, including young people. There's been a critical role for community anchor or grassroots organisations, what you call, I think, locally trusted organisations in street games. And also we've seen digital connections as a way of organising. But all of that, I think we need to balance that kind of positive view of the community contribution to the high levels of need that have been exposed and exacerbated by the pandemic. And I don't need to sort of dwell on that because I think Martina has sort of highlighted that. But you only have to think, much of the volunteering has occurred in response to that. And you only have to think about food banks and food parcels to sort of see that relationship between response of people in solidarity with those in need. We've had seen a huge disruption in volunteering and community organisation as people have had to adapt in neighbourhoods and in groups to what was happening. And I don't think we fully understand that disruption yet, what's happened. But what we do know is that there are risks that some of the inequalities there were in participation. So if you're healthier and wealthier, you're more likely to volunteer because is it basically because it's easier and you have less of the barriers to it. And some of those inequalities to taking part in things have, may have got worse during the pandemic. And I'm sorry, as a researcher, I'm really interested in finding out more about this, but I don't think we know this yet. We're still working through all of this. So it's really to say community approaches are still highly relevant but we have some additional challenges with the pandemic. So to move on to some of the practical stuff, um, how do then we go about working um, at a community level? And many of you on this webinar will, this will be the bread and butter of what you do and the expertise and wisdom sort of lies with you. Um, my job as a sort of researcher has been to pull some of that information and knowledge together and the first thing I think is to say that part of the way we work to ensure that communities are at the heart of the, joining those dots are to think about community assets and to take what's called an asset orientation. Now that can feel like a lot of jargon, but what we're really saying is that I think in the past, communities were only defined by their levels of deprivation and the things that were missing. And an asset orientation doesn't ignore that, but what it does is try to make more visible those building blocks that are in communities, that um, what we call the assets, that can be building blocks for taking forward action. And those things are often hidden in the sort of traditional public health approaches. And they could include the skills and knowledge of community members, so friendship networks, informal groups, as well as formal voluntary organisations, you know, churches, faith organisations, schools, and the green space, blue space, the, the built environment, you know, the transport links and so on. So it can be, in each community, it'll be different. But I think that asset orientation is a fundamental part of that. And I just want to illustrate that again with something from the pandemic. Because in the middle of all of this sort of terrible sort of um, 
public health challenge. And Newham in London being one of the areas that had some of the highest rates of sort of COVID and the biggest health challenges, taking an assets orientation meant thinking about how they connected with um, their local community and to get messages out. And I think it sort of shows this sort of issue of trust here, this quote. So um, Jason and Anne from Newham um, Public Health are talking about this in a blog. And they're talking about Abdul, Adyan and Tanya. And um, one of these is a, a school pupil, a, a younger champion. But all their fellow champions bring so much to the partnership, all their relationships with the mosque, with the Gurdwara, the church members, their co-workers, their friends, their schoolmates and the people they meet every day and the those they care for. Most importantly, the champions are trusted by their community. So if a champion sends something to someone in their network, it's likely that the person receiving it will pay more attention, trust it more and be more open to the content. So I think this sort of demonstrates this issue of trust and that's what the community centered approaches that are building those trusting relationships can really offer. So in Public Health England, we've done quite a lot of work to try and understand the diversity of approaches um, that have an evidence base behind them. So hopefully some of you may have seen uh, the, this notion of a family tree, a family of community centered approaches, recognizing that there's a huge range of things that can be used. We can use um, approaches that strengthen communities, community development approaches, where people are coming together to identify local issues and build sustainable action. We can use volunteer approaches where the focus is on building individuals' capacity and capability to take on that, a role in their community. We can think about collaborations and partnerships, we sometimes call that co-production, but where um, services and, and communities are working together to design and deliver services. And we can think about how we widen access to the resources already in communities through things like social prescribing and community hubs. And I did a bit of work for this presentation to see if I could find examples around poverty and health and young people related to this um, conference. And Public Health England have a huge um, bank of practice examples which are all accessible and some of them are actually uh, the two that are street games practice examples but these illustrate these approaches in practice and what they look like so we've got example um, communities driving change that's an initiative in tower hamlets um, look at taking a neighborhood level and using a community development approach to reorientate all their public health work around health and well-being. And one of the areas, one of the neighbourhoods has taken a focus on young people working particularly with youth centres. There's an example around Get Old and Growing, which is about community ownership of part land and in parks to sort of start to develop um, sustainable food. But it's really about communities organising local assets and, and running those. We've got lots of examples of volunteer and peer roles. Um, there's obviously the Street Games Young Volunteers. There's a fantastic project in Leeds where I work called Dance Action Leads, which is where young people are involved through participating in dance and then go on to be dance sort of leaders themselves engaging other young people. And the Young Health Champions from the Royal Society of Public Health. We've got a lovely example in the PHE practice examples of participatory action research in schools in Doncaster, involving young people, gathering their insights so that they can shape young people's services and young people being researchers to gather the views of other young peoples. And then things around the access to community resources, the social prescribing youth network, which I know many of you will be involved in, but also an example in our public health and practice examples, us girls, which involved a football club as a community anchor working with street games to increase access for girls sport. So you can see that this is a highly practical framework that can be applied. I also um, want to spend just a few minutes talking about the role of um, local um, community based organisations. Now I know in street games you call these locally trusted organisations and um, in other uh, parts, you know, organisations call them different things. They can be called community hubs or community anchors. But fundamentally, these are neighbourhood based organisations that have a connection with and in communities. 
And these organisations, I think, incredibly important for joining the dots and for uh, implementing community-centred approaches. And here's a lovely example from a community centre in Newcastle, HealthWorks, um, where they mapped all the work they were doing in yellow against the family tree of community-centred approaches. And I think this is important because often things are not single projects that work in isolation. There are a series of interconnected approaches and activities which each have their history and relationships and development grow and people sometimes come into one project and end up volunteering in another. And I think that um, community hubs or locally trusted organisations are an incredibly important um, connection point in all of this. And just to back that up, um, we've got some evidence um, which our research centre did for the What Work Centre for Wellbeing. And this looked, it was a systematic review that looked at interventions in community infrastructure. It's such a wordy title, but places and spaces to boost social relations and wellbeing. And it, it goes over a load of range of approaches, including community events and green space and so on. But I think that one of the key conclusions is that community hubs and others locally trusted organisations, the interventions placed in those to increase well-being can increase social cohesion, social capital, trust, wider social networks and interaction, knowledge and skills. So there's a good evidence base um, around there. And I think also are important coordination organisations. So I said I'd talk a little bit about some of the resources. P public Health England, um, part of my work in Public Health England has been to develop, a, a, if you like, a bank of evidence-based resources which help people explain what they're doing and also um, evidence what, what they're doing. And we all know in community organisations often need to make a case to commissioners and to the health system that what they're doing matters for health. So I thought you might be interested in a, a tool that was launched very recently, a couple of months ago, on inclusive and sustainable economies, leaving no one behind. And there's a whole lot of data sets and uh, through that link and frameworks available through that. But I think the key thing here is if we're talking about the recovery we're, and sustainable economies, we're talking about social, economic and environmental. And it may be some of... Um, street games can kind of play into that um, that framework because it seems to fit with so much you do. But there's a whole lot of resources on here um, that you can access. And I know sometimes that the wisdom is it already in community organisations and in the street games network, but it's sometimes about mapping that so that you can um, make that case or so that commissioners can see that why involving people in sport, in a neighbourhood sport, actually matters for longer term health goals around mental health and inclusion. So I'm just going to finish here, um, a few minutes for questions, but some concluding thoughts really. And I've structured that around thinking, doing and learning. I think an assets orientation really means thinking differently about our starting points, how we work and our outcomes. So we're valuing things like trust and social cohesion. But this always should be balanced with addressing needs and exclusion. The two for me go hand in hand. We need to, there's lots that can be done at a community level. And um, the community centred approaches can be applied as part of a strategic evidence based way to reducing health inequalities. And I think, as hopefully I've illustrated, this applies as much in the pandemic and in recovery as it has always applied. And finally, the le learning is important that often grassroots community practice looks a bit different in each area and, that, and it should be different. So learning. Um, Need, we need to share that valuable learning and that, that learning should include the experiences of young people because to go back to my previous thought, we can't design solutions to addressing the health gap without involving the people most impacted by that gap. And I'm finishing there. Thanks, Jane. That was fantastic. Um, impeccable timing um, as well. But so many things I think that really link into um, 
to the work that um, the Sprint Games, those big trusted organisations do around social subscribing and, and, and other aspects. So um, I am going to come on to questions, Paul. I'm going to give you one moment because I, I want to make sure we get a couple of questions in. But just to um, let you know what the outcome of the poll was, um, that people felt that um, what had the biggest impact on um, your own health was lifestyle behaviours at 70 percent and then social circumstances at 30 percent and access to health services got a zero. Um, actually, I'm going to put the link in the chat and um, this is um, linked to um, some research from McInnes et al from 2002 um, and actually circles, social circumstances have slightly more impact. Um, generally um, from that research on health than behaviour. So social circumstances, 45%, behaviour, 40%, and then healthcare, 15%. So I'll put the link up um, in the chat, but that's really interesting. Um, Paul, a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks, Emma. That uh, uh, was really interesting. I was watching the poll as we were going, and it was changing as the presentations were <laughs> happening, which was... Uh, so live learning, that's fantastic, isn't it? It's obviously working. Um, yeah, so a question, there's, there's more questions than we can pick up. So I'm, I'm sorry if we um, aren't going to pick up your question right now, but we will attempt to answer these afterwards, if not. Um, from Lisa Graham, because I think this might be one that you could pick up, Jane, um, is how do we ensure, oh, there's so many coming in, it keeps jumping off my screen. How do we ensure these insights drive home to local authorities with regards to the positive benefits to sports participation? Um, Lisa describes it as a bit of a postcode lottery. Um, and I think with uh, your... Mm -hmm uh foot in academia and PHE in public health England that's that must be one that you're uh, you're tussling with all the time how do we how do we get this awareness and understanding into more widespread and, and into action well I think there's a number of methods that can be used and you probably in the street game network um have your that Kevin Fenton led it called beyond the data and this report uh the, the recommendations from it um which the um, equalities minister sort of um, highlighted was that that we do need participatory research and we do need participatory methods to really hear people's experiences. Not enough just to send out a survey. We need to know what that's like in order to address some of these inequalities. So I think that's a, a really powerful um, argument. Uh, but. Um, I think also things like the sort of joint strategic needs assessments, asking to present information, evidence to those and where sort of there will be sort of panels and commissions around COVID recovery and so on. And I think it's about making sure that people are, you know, putting their foot in the door and getting those insights into that situation. Thank you. Martina, do you... Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think participatory, uh, participatory approaches, I just completely agree with Jane. Um, a lot of the work that we look at, you, you, you have to do things hand in hand, really. And um, um, because we work so much with complexity, really working with the people who live and understand um, what's going on is is just so important. We do quite a lot of work with um, the Born in Bradford team. Um, and one of the things that we've been, well, you know, they were talking to me about difficulty was um, most stressful. And I think there's just a real challenge in research um, about um, understanding some of these things that actually participatory, uh, participatory methods can really help with and get get through with and through to because there's sort of people who are living through these experiences who are helping design the research who are helping um sort of um, really work through um the concerns and, and and interests that are that are on the ground um yeah thank you I think, Paul, I, think, time, I think we're out of time. Yeah, we're <laughs> one minute over, so I'm sorry. But I just wanted to finish by saying thank you so much um, to everybody who's been here for all your contributions and to Street Games for this session, which I think has been fantastic, and to um, Martina um, and Jane for those presentations. I think we've really got a kind of a whole lot of data and tools that we can take away 
to think about how we back up the things that we do that we know work for young people and and how are those kind of fitting in with um the, the evidence that we have out there but i think we've also heard a lot of practical things that we can actually do um, uh, that link in with those data, which is which is fantastic. But I think also what is really important sometimes in the work that we do is to get the inspiration to feel that what the work that we're doing day to day um, is making a real difference. Um, and I really liked what Jane said about um, how can we build an approach which works without involving those people who it affects. And I think kind of that will really stay with me because we need to, you know, go back to all of those busy days and weeks that we have working with young people um, and, and, and remembering that they um, have got to be at the heart of, um, of approaches that are going to work to improve some of these complex um, um, and difficult um, problems that they face. Um, so without any further ado, thank you, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm sure those questions will be, you know, responded to at some yep. point um, via Paul. Um, but really lovely um, to to be with you all this. A lot of stuff to work there with, um, but don't be put off. I think don't spend too long planning and trying to work it all out. Just get going and learn as you go. I think that's that's the thing. So start with start with the, I think in Jane's slide, start with the doing and, and do the thinking and the planning as well. Do it all at the same time, but don't let the enemy. Uh, don't let the great be the enemy of the good. There are lots more healthy workshops coming up, so look forward to seeing you there. And thanks very much to uh, to our chair and presenters. Brilliant job.